When it's born, it's just a foot high. But the closer it gets to the shore, the larger it grows. Soon, it enters shallow waters and starts to slow down. Down there, humans, tiny like ants, scream and scatter in different directions. The first tsunami wave crashes into the shore. Its top moves faster than the bottom. That's what makes the wave so high and steep. The lowest point of the wave gets to dry land first. In the process, it creates a vacuum effect, which pulls the water away from the coast, bearing the harbor and sea floor. Those who recognize this first sign of an approaching tsunami still have the chance to save their lives. Five minutes later, and an enormous wall of water hits the shore and wipes out everything in its way. But it's not just a single wave, there are many. This phenomenon is called a wave train. How fast this train is traveling depends not on how far it is from the source of the waves, but on the ocean depth. Tsunamis can move as fast as a jet plane in the middle of the ocean, but once they enter shallow waters, their speed drops. It's very different when we talk about a tsunami's height. On the surface of the open ocean, it's often no higher than one foot. That's why even experienced sailors may not notice such unassuming waves. But the sea rises dramatically once the tsunami nears the shore. The first tsunami wave isn't usually the strongest, but lots of people don't know it and make a grave mistake that sometimes costs them their lives. After the first wave is gone, they relax and believe the danger is over. That's why the next waves, much bigger and more powerful, catch them off guard. The scariest thing about tsunamis is that they can travel across entire oceans with almost no energy loss. A tsunami can travel thousands of feet inland. It's usually so much water that its enormous weight and force sweep away everything in its path. Cars, trees, people, and even buildings. The roar of an approaching tsunami is louder than a jet taking off. Sometimes, a tsunami comes as a torrent of foaming water. At other times, it makes the sea withdraw, leaving behind stranded fish and overturned boats. But what can cause a tsunami, one of the most merciless and devastating natural disasters? In more than 70% of cases, it's an underwater earthquake. For example, the Boxing Day tsunami, which occurred in 2004 in Indonesia, was triggered by an undersea earthquake. The tremors produced several massive waves. The largest of them was as tall as the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. A landslide can also cause a monster of a tsunami, as it happened in 1963 in Italy. Then, more than 9 billion cubic feet of forest, soil, and rock rolled down into a lake. A dark wall of water covered the sky over a tiny village at the bottom of the Viant Dam, one of the tallest in the world. With a deafening roar, the wave overtopped the edge of the dam, taking out everything in its way. The 1980 mega tsunami in the USA was also caused by a landslide. The upper 1,500 feet of Mount St. Helens collapsed after a volcanic eruption. A part of this avalanche plunged into Spirit Lake. It pushed the lake waters into a series of waves almost as tall as the Eiffel Tower. Volcanic eruptions are responsible for 5% of the world's tsunamis. For example, a terrifying tsunami that occurred in 1883 was caused by the Krakatoa volcano going off in the Sundra Strait. The eruption nearly emptied the magma crater under the volcano. The overlying seabed and land collapsed into it. This created several tsunami waves that rose higher than 130 feet above sea level. Some tsunamis are caused by meteorites crashing into our planet. That's what happened millions of years ago when an asteroid struck the Yucatan Peninsula. Yep, the same one that's thought to have wiped out the dinosaurs. It generated a mega tsunami, the largest in Earth's history. The first wave was almost twice as big as the world's tallest building, the Burj Khalifa. But most tsunamis, about 80% of them, get born in the Pacific Ocean's Ring of Fire. Why? Well, this region got its name for a reason. It witnesses tons of volcanic eruptions. The Portuguese navigator and explorer Ferdinand Magellan 
visited the world's largest ocean at the beginning of the 16th century. He found the waters surprisingly calm. That's why the place was called the Pacific Peaceful Ocean. Little did the traveler know that it was home to the Ring of Fire. It's a 25,000 mile long horseshoe shaped chain of volcanoes and other seismically active spots. It starts from the southern tip of South America and goes all the way up to the North American coast and the Aleutian Islands. Then it moves down toward Japan, the Philippines, and Indonesia. After that, the chain curves back into New Guinea, covers the Southwest Pacific Islands, and ends in New Zealand. Right now, the Ring of Fire isn't actually a closed ring, but if you consider Antarctica's dormant volcanoes, you'll get the needed shape. The largest and most active volcanoes on the planet are in this region. They're Mauna Loa and Kilauea in Hawaii, Mount Fuji in Japan, Mount St. Helens in the USA, Krakatoa in Indonesia, and many others. Anyway, the volcanic chain outlines the Pacific Ocean and goes over the meeting points of many tectonic plates. The largest of them are North American, Eurasian, Caribbean, Antarctic, and others. These plates never stop moving. They collide into, slide past, and move below and above each other. This relentless activity makes volcanoes erupt. Deep ocean trenches appear seemingly out of the blue. The seven-mile-deep Mariana Trench, the world's deepest part of the ocean, is also in the Ring of Fire. It was formed when one tectonic plate was pushed under another. These days, the Nazca Ocean Plate is being forced down and under the South American Continental Plate. Unfortunately, the first plate doesn't want to go down smoothly. The process uplifts mountains and sends magma closer to the surface. When energy gets released from the molten core of our planet, tectonic plates move and scrape against each other. Pressure builds up in those areas and then produces earthquakes. Their epicenters are scattered along the areas where the tectonic plates meet. Almost 90% of all the earthquakes in the world happen in the Ring of Fire. The strongest earthquake ever recorded happened in that region. It was 9.5 out of 10 on the Richter scale. The Valdivia earthquake, also called the Great Chilean earthquake, happened on May 22, 1960. It lasted for almost 10 minutes. The disaster affected an area the size of California. It also caused huge tsunami waves that reached the shores of Hawaii, Japan, the Philippines, Australia, and New Zealand. Experts often describe the Ring of Fire as a coincidence. When natural disasters break out on its opposite sides at the same time, they're never related. For example, in 2016, several earthquakes rocked Kyushu Island in Japan. Soon after that, Chile also experienced a powerful earthquake, 7.2 on the Richter scale. But neither of those quakes set off the other. The distance between the epicenters was around 10,000 miles. This gap was way too large for the disasters to be connected. Anyway, an undersea earthquake makes the ocean floor suddenly rise or fall at the boundary of tectonic plates. This displaces immense volumes of water and launches the waves that soon turn into a tsunami. And since earthquakes happen in the Ring of Fire more often than anywhere else on the planet, this region also sets off lots of tsunamis. By the way, even though the Pacific is the largest ocean on the planet, it might disappear in the next 300 million years. The tectonic plates are drifting, the Atlantic keeps opening, and the Pacific is closing. Incredibly slowly, but still. One day, the Americas may collide with Antarctica, which is drifting northward. After that, Asia and Australia are likely to join this new supercontinent. This process might create a new Pangaea. It was an ancient supercontinent. At those times, the only one on Earth. It started to break apart about 200 million years ago. Some geologists don't support this theory. They believe that the Atlantic or the Arctic Oceans are more likely to disappear than the Pacific. 